Hello, my name is Caroline Alvarez, and today uh, we will be presenting on innovative approaches to statistical analysis, uh, specifically joint modeling of time to event and longitudinal data. I will be uh, giving the first half of the presentation, and Lubo Varbiva will continue with the second half. Uh, we have nothing to disclose, and these are some of the uh, key um, references related to our presentation today. So just briefly, our objectives today will deal with identifying research questions and really the types of data which are most applicable for joint model methodology. Uh, we want to help you understand the features of statistical joint modeling. Specifically, we're going to be going over the differences compared to more standard time to event models and mixed models for longitudinal data. Uh, and then we'll go over uh, very generally uh, the application of joint models to examples that can be an example that is relevant and comparable to, that, to data that you might find. So just briefly the outline, we will be going, we will be having an overview of methods like longitudinal data analysis using mixed models as well as time to event data analysis using survival models before uh, we move on to joint model. Uh, we will be concentrating for most of the presentation on joint modeling of time to event and longitudinal data and then we will go over this analysis framework for the statistical methods. So let's start with an example, uh, and we'll be using a researcher as an example here. Let's say a researcher has a question uh, that deals with an interest in describing differences in physical function between those that receive and don't receive uh, some sort of NEOA physical therapy. So our researcher might come with this question to our statistician, and the statistician might begin by asking what type of study the data comes from. So we learned from our researcher that the data is from a randomized controlled study with longitudinal data. And the statistician might continue by asking about the outcome. So for example, in this case, it seems like the outcome of interest is physical function. So the statistician might ask how physical function was assessed and really what he's trying to get at is what type of variable this is. So we learned that physical function in this context can be evaluated using a score. And this is a score that comes from the physical function subscale from the Womack OA index. So it seems that this Womack physical function score can possibly be treated like a continuous variable. So given that information, we might ask further what the interest really is in describing this Womack score and time. And so this is important, and Dr. R tells us that the interest is in describing differences in this physical function score as it changes over time. So there might be a few further questions, for example, whether the researcher expects participants to differ in that score at baseline, and also whether uh, he expects participants to differ in their rate of change of that score over time. And we learn from the researcher that Let's say in this case, the study didn't necessarily exclude participants based on score. So yes, it is likely that there are differences at baseline, as well as it is possible that there are differences in the rate of change of WOMAC over time. Okay, so the statistician now might move from asking about the outcome to asking about the main exposure, which in this case is this uh, physical therapy status for NEOA. So he might begin by asking if this assessment is static or is varying over time. And we learned from Dr. R that the NEOA therapy was assigned at baseline and didn't necessarily change during the course of the study, during the course of the shorter study. So again, he reiterates that his interest is in how the NEOA therapy baseline status is predictive of changes in physical function will make score over time. So, this seems to be sufficient to at least have an idea. And given the needs and the data, it seems that a longitudinal data analysis using a linear mixed effects model might be appropriate in this case. Which brings us to this overview of longitudinal data analysis using specifically mixed models. So the linear mixed model uh, in the context that we'll be overviewing today, we can think of it as a special case of mixed regression. But mixed regression, you have some sort of correlation or really it's a dependence that typically comes from sources that are nested. So you can think of patients within a hospital or students within a school or children within a family. In the linear mix model, the correlation or the nesting that we see is really within a person because we are taking repeated measurements 
of that person over time. So you might have heard of the linear mix model with, uh, with in other terms, multi-level models, hierarchical linear models, random effects models. They are typically talking about the same thing. It is one of the most commonly used approaches for analysis when you are dealing with a continuous longitudinal outcome. And it's important to remember that the linear mix model is individual specific uh, or subject specific. So the important thing there is that it's modeling the outcome trajectory for each individual. So that then this average sample trajectory, it's really a summary of all of those individual trajectories. So why do we use the term mixed in linear mixed? Uh, this means that we have both fixed and random effects in the same model. So fixed effects are representing just mean sample trajectories. But uh, with random effects, we're taking into account the variability that is introduced by the individual trajectories within the sample. So how is this different from a linear model? So in a linear model, you usually have at least one, usually more fixed effects, and of course the general term to one to end different fixed effects that you may be considering. So you have this continuous outcome, and you're just collecting it one time for each subject. Once you begin repeating those measures on the same subject, you're collecting that measure multiple times for each subject, your assumption of independence between those observations is violated and you have to go to more condensed methods that take into account the correlation. And so we can represent the function now this way when we are in this situation where each subject has an intercept to contribute this B, lowercase b0, and each subject I has a slope to contribute B1. Um, and those vary about the overall mean sample intercept beta zero and sample, inter and sample slope beta one. So the random effects are allowed to vary across the subjects due to their individual differences. Um, and that's why we can think of them as subject specific or individual specific regression reflecting that, originating the population. So let's again look at this equation. Again, we have our outcome Y, our continuous outcome for each participant i at each time t, we have our fixed effects presenting our mean population intercept and slope. These are our betas. And we have our random effects represented here by our b's, our lowercase b's, which are uh, the intercept b0 and the slope b1 for each person i, as well as our error term. So let's just briefly look at that. Uh, Graphically, if we have our time here on our x-axis and our continuous outcome here on the y, if each of these colored dots is one specific person, so this person, and measure them again here, and measure them again here, measure them again here, what we're doing in the linear mixed model, we are modeling these individual regression lines. Again, so that each person has an intercept, b0i, again, each person has an intercept, and each person has a slope, b1, associated with their trajectory. So what we're doing is LMM is basically estimating then the mean trajectory, the mean trajectory given by beta zero for intercept and a beta one for slope. And so just to conclude here with the LMM, why is it so advantageous compared to other approaches that can also take into account correlation over time? Well, really it can deal very well with unbalanced data. And unbalanced, unbalanced data, one of the main examples is when not all subjects have the same number of repeated measurements over time. So the perfect example is, is a subject sticking a visit. So we saw that here, for example. This subject is missing this second visit here. That's very common. And also not all subjects necessarily being measured at exactly the same times. So there's usually some time variability in follow-up. Some people being measured slightly earlier or later at follow-ups um, over time. So again, these are not necessarily all measured at the same time after baseline. Uh, an additional advantage of LMM is you can be, have a little more freedom in the form of the variance matrix. So again, this is a way of handling the correlation among observations. You can uh, accommodate for more complex patterns. And again, with respect to either the biological variation you expect among the subjects, as well as the variation that you expect within the subjects. This can again be due to time separation. So let's go back to our researcher. 
into a different question this time. Let's say the interest now is in describing differences in EOA status depending on something, in this case, let's say neighborhood safety. So again, he comes to the researcher with, to the statistician, sorry, with this question. And the statistician can typically, again, begin with a similar question, what type of study uh, this data is sourced from. And so in this case, we learned that this is from an observational study. And these are patients who already have a way who are coming to clinic uh, and you're collecting non decisional data for them over time. So in this case, the outcome of interest seems to be this NEOA status. So a similar question to what we saw before, you should be thinking of what the interest is in describing this variable with regards to this NEOA status in time. This is a different answer from the previous example. Here the interest is in describing differences in the time to worsening of NEOA. So it seems in this case that the NEOA can be treated like a time to event variable. So again, how is this worsening assessed? Usually we're looking for some definition of this happening or not. You can think of it like an event. Uh, and in this case, the NEOA worsening we learned from the researcher can be defined as an increase of at least one grade in Kelvin Lorenz measured during clinic visits in the radiographs. Okay, so now we move on from looking at the outcome to looking at our mean exposure, which in this case is this uh, measure of neighborhood safety. So similar to before, we asked if this is something static or if it is something that will vary over time, over the course of the study. And in this case, we learned that, let's say that this is something that's updated decade, every decade at the state level. And so in other words, the researcher doesn't expect that this will change greatly during the study time. So his interest is in how this neighborhood safety score at baseline is predictive of a NEOA worsening event. So the conclusion here, it seems that a time to event data analysis using a cost proportional hazards model might be appropriate in this case. And that brings us to this overview of time to event data analysis using survival models. And specifically here, we're going to be concentrating on the more widely used cost proportional hazards model, CPHM. Uh, of course, there are other methods available to analyze time to event data, or metric models, but that's beyond the scope of our presentation today. So cost proportional hazards model, one of the most widely used analysis for time to event data. And again, in all survival or time to event analysis, the outcome of interest is not only the fact that an event has occurred, but also the timing to that event. In rheumatology, we can find many examples of this. We can be time to total and replacement, time to incidents of some sort of neo A and an X ray, and so on. There are other examples here. So Briefly, it's important to remember what are the unique features or properties of time to event data that uh, lead us to have to address it with other uh, methods beyond more standard statistical procedures. You can, and, and, you know, if you were to think of logistic regression or linear regression. And the main one here is censoring. So just remember, censoring has to deal with an event that is not observed during our study follow up. And just briefly, Right censoring, which is the most common that you might encounter. You have a start period of observation up to a stop time of observation. During that time, you're observing the patient, the subject participant uh, for the event occurring. Uh, but if by the end of your observation period, if that patient has not had the event, you really have no information of whether they do have the event after that. And if they do, at what time it happens. That observation would be right sensor. Left sensory, you can also encounter, a little bit less common maybe, uh, but by the time you are observing a patient, of course, there are people that might have already had the event of interest. And again, there is this, uh, you don't know when that event might have happened before the starting time of observation. And it's important to mention interval censoring, um, which you can think of almost like a combination of right and left sensory where you have your time of observation here, let's say by follow-up one, the subject has yet to have an event, but when you see them by follow-up two, they have had the event. And so you don't know in this time scale here when that event occurred. And maybe this is not so important when your follow-ups are very close to each other, in months or in a few years, but if these follow-ups are very far apart in five, eight, 10 years, this is something to consider 
that really these are integral centered values. And just to remember as well, the survival times themselves are not symmetrically distributed, so they might look something very skewed like this. Um, and it's important to handle that as well. So just to remind you about the hazard function, and this is used to really express the risk. We can also think of it as an instantaneous rate of event occurrence. And it uh, is related to the unspecified baseline hazard. Uh, it's a feature of the Cox proportional hazard model. You don't have to specify the form of the baseline hazard, as well as what we are really interested here, which are our explanatory variables. So we have your vector coefficients gamma for each of our explanatory variables, um, W. Let's think of a very simple thing. Let's say our risk of some sort of event is going to be neo wave. Uh, we are modeling the dependent on gender and race, and we would write out the hazard function this way. And if we take the logarithm of both sides, this is useful because now we can see that we have this change in log hazard as an incremental. Um, change in the log scale. So again, if we're looking at this very simple example, how would we then interpret the results? We usually construct the hazard ratio, where we take the hazard for one group over the hazard for another group, and that way we can talk about differences in the risk of event related maybe to difference in gender or difference in race for both groups. And so if I go back to, again, the same example, and let's just use gender, we can plot this in a very simple way. If I did have gender as my only um, explanatory variable here, and I plot time on the x-axis and the log hazard on the y-axis, this is what I should expect to see. So in this case, if I just have males and females, let's say males have their log hazard plotted out this way, and females should have that log hazard with a difference in gamma. The very important thing here is to note that gamma is constant. The difference in the log hazard, in this case, between males and females should stay constant over time. That's the very important thing to note here. Because, of course, that brings us to one of the main assumptions of Cox proportional hazards model, the proportional hazards assumption. And this means that the size of the effect of that covariate, like an example with software gender, on the log hazard should remain again, constant during the entire follow-up period. And there are others, of course, you want to make sure that you have linearity in the relationship between the log hazard and the covariates. So again, you are assuming that linearity in the form of this function. And there are, of course, other things you need to check on, outliers with certain residuals, like marginal residuals and jumping residuals, and so on. But let's go back to this assumption of the proportional hazards assumption. And let's think of what we can do in the analysis when this is violated. So the strategy in this case should depend on the study objectives. So for example, if there is no specific interest in very long follow-up periods, you might think of shortening of follow-up times and seeing if in that shorter follow-up time you can assume proportional hazard. But there are other approaches. So as well, you can think if you're not necessarily interested in the variable with the time varying effect, you can just think of stratifying the results by that variable. But what if you are interested in describing that effect of this variable over time? Well, you can either think of adding an interaction term of that covariate with time, or you can think of going to uh, the extended Cox model with time varying covariates. And again, especially if your covariate itself is being repeated and measured over time this is a very useful approach. And that's what we're gonna be talking briefly now for the remainder of this overview. And so let's go back to our example of NEOA and neighborhood safety. If our researcher were to return and say that there's a change in this analysis of NEOA status and neighborhood safety, it might let us know that the nature and the source of the neighborhood safety variable has changed. And so again, we would be interested in this, of oh, is this variable now static? Is it still static or is it now varying over time? And we learned that it has changed. The scores may be now available at the regional level instead of the state level. In other words, what we care about is that it is now an annual score. 
and it will change during the course of the study time. And, and most importantly, the researcher is interested in how this score over time is predictive of when EOA works in the event. So this might lead us to then use a time-dependent cost proportional hazard model, this extended model. And so when we are modeling with time varying covariates, we can do two very important things. So we can address the violation of proportional hazards assumption, but we can also utilize all the data that is collected at different times for a specific time varying covariate. And it might be useful if we look at this uh, with this figure. So again, this model with time varying covariates, if we have our follow up time here on the, on the x axis, again, maybe baseline, a year, two years, three years. We have this continuous time varying covariate here on the Y. If we were to look at one participant, for example, we might plot him out to look like this. So we see him, he has a value associated with him, and then until we see him again, we get a second reading, a third reading, and a fourth reading. So two important things to note here. Until we see this person again, we don't have his next reading. So we really don't know what happens between this time. So we assume it stays constant with the previous reading until we are able to re-record that. Uh, and something else to note here, he is not necessarily seen at exactly the same times during his follow-up. So there is some variability there. And then this person might have the event later on. And just to compare here, let's think of another participant. And an important comparison here, contrast here, is that this participant skips this first visit. So in his case, you see that until we see him by this second follow-up, we don't have an information on his uh, on his covariate change. So in his case, we not always, but we might just assume that his previous value stays constant until we read it again. And again, note that he does not come at exactly the exact same times as the prior participant who comes slightly earlier or later. And this person might be accepted. So this very nice figure here from um, this book, very good book, Risopoulos, we see the same thing I was talking about here on the bottom, where we have the time-dependent covariate, and we have the step function that results right, as we measure the variable over time, and we update the variable over time. And then here we have, he has, he has nicely the hazard function superimposed on the top here for the event that we might be measuring. So important things to remember of how, with regards to how the Cox model handles time varying covariates. Number one, you are again assuming that this change, uh, this value change happens at the specific visit. This is when we're able to measure it, and so that's when you assume that it changes. That's, that's an assumption that you're making. It might be a limitation. And the other assumption that you're making is that it, that value remains constant until you see the participant or the person again. So again, you look at this horizontal step here. That's what that means. You're assuming it stays constant until you measure it again. And so keep in mind how the step function looks, how this path might look uh, that you assume for the covariate. And for example, think of how this would apply maybe to a biomarker um, whereas in some points it might be appropriate and at some point it might not be. So just to summarize our overview of LMM and CPHM, we saw the linear model was very, very commonly used and very advantageous for continuous outcomes. We talked about some of the advantages of, being, of it being able to handle not just fixed but also random effects, uh, how it allows for missing data, different types data and unbalanced data, and one of those is unequally spaced time intervals. Uh, didn't go too much into, the, into this, but extensions, if you had a non-continuous outcome, uh, might be more complex. And importantly here, uh, LMM cannot handle missing not at random MNAR data. So you can think of this as informative dropout. Uh, this would lead to bias estimates in this case, and this is something that Luboff will go into later on, she will come back to this. And we also saw, saw that the Cox proportional hazards model, we're dealing with time to event outcomes, we can incorporate centering information. Specifically, we talked about right centering, but of course, left and interval centering as well. We can incorporate, extend the model to time varying covariates, uh, and specifically with CPHM as compared to parametric models, you can avoid the assumption 
of a shape of the baseline boundary. And some limitations uh, are the main ones that we touched upon at the end. Again, these assumptions that you have to make regarding time bearing covariate as it changes over time. And then we didn't go too much into this, but extensions sometimes to non right centering, specifically uh, interval centering, might lead to more complex approaches. Hi everyone, my name is Libo Farbeva. I will continue with this presentation. Uh, so now we have uh, briefly uh, overviewed the, the Cox proportion hazard model and linear mix model. Uh, continuing to the main topic of this presentation, different models. I will start with the next example. And here's uh, our Dr. R with his new research question. Now he is interested in describing differences in total hip replacement depending on the physical function. And uh, as always, uh, Dr. S wants to know more about the study. And um, uh, here is his uh, first question. Uh, what is the type of study where the data will be sourced from? And um, Dr. R explains that uh, the data were collected from hip OA patients undergoing physical therapy and um, they see the patients uh, every month. And uh, now we understand that this is a longitudinal study because they see the patients uh, every month. And Dr. S um, needs more information about dependent and independent variables, in other words, about the outcome and covariance. He's asking about total hip replacement surgery to figure out what type of outcome they have. So here's his next question, what are you interested in describing in regard to total hip replacement? And Dr. R explains that he wants to describe the differences in the time of total hip replacement. So they actually don't see patients after surgery in the clinic, but they know exact date of surgery from hospital records. Now Dr. S is curious, do you know this date for all patients? And uh, of course they don't, because um, if patients uh, benefit uh, from PT, they don't have um, surgery and um, they don't have uh, the date of surgery. So we have two groups. The first group is uh, the patients with hip OA having total hip replacement with the exact date of surgery. And second group, uh, patients that benefit from PT and um, they don't have surgery, but you know the date of the last PT session. So the second group are sensitive participants. So we can see now that uh, the time to total hip replacement will be known only for participants who had surgery. Otherwise, participants will be right sensitive. This is time to event outcome. And um, now they talk more about independent variable. The next question is uh, tell me more about uh, physical function. And um, Dr. R explains that physical function can be evaluated using scores from the physical function subscale from the WOMOX uh, OA index. And this is continuous time bearing covariate. And Dr. R, S, our statistician, uh, proposes a joint model uh, for the analysis. Uh, so now it's time to answer Dr. R's question. And the first one is uh, why joint model and why this model is more appropriate than Cook's uh, proportional hazards model. Dr. S explains that uh, this is because the exposure variable is internal, um, which requires special treatment. So this is the first time when we introduce this term internal and Dr. S uh, wants to explain more about this, so I will take over and um, start our introduction uh, to joint modeling of time to event and original. Uh, I will first uh, explain the differences between internal and external time varying covariates and uh, why it's so important to distinguish between these uh, categories. The good example of external covariate, uh, age, time of the day or season of the year. They change in a known way. 
Another example of uh, the variables uh, whose complete path uh, is predetermined from the beginning of the study, and for example, the dose of the drug. Uh, it can be adjusted according to some criteria that we knew before study begins. The external covariates can be also uh, of stochastic nature, so they can change a lot very a lot, but what is important here, they are external to the subjects. Uh, the air pollution temperature, uh, the good examples here, also discovery can be associated with the risk for the event, like the level of the air pollution can be associated with worsening of asthma, but they are independent of an um, individual time period outcome. The statistical analysis with total covariance is uh, more complicated. Um, first of all, they are typically measured with error. And by error, we, uh, here we mean the biological variation induced uh, by the subject under study, and not the error induced by the measurement procedure. For example, if we weight the same person twice, once in the morning and then after lunch, you will probably observe different values of his weight. Uh, and another important feature of internal coverage is that the level is drawn for the specific occasions only. For example, when he is in doctor's office or in the study center. So the complete pass up to any time is not completely absolute. So this is a graphical representation of how, for example, the Cox proportion hazard model uh, handles time varying covariates under counter process. The time dependent covariate uh, is uh, assumed to change its value at follow up visit, remain constant until the next visit, and the hazard for an event will be associated with this. Uh, let's finish with the uh, Cox proportional hazards model with time varying covariates. Uh, this extension of well known Cox proportional hazards model is not only allows for time varying covariates, but also can handle left truncation, multiple events per subject, and uh, very, it has many other features. Uh, it works well with external covariates when the value of this covariate at time t is not affected by the occurrence of an event at time point C minus K. But like I told you and like uh, Carolina explained, um, uh, this model ignores measurement errors and biological variations in biomarker and um, assumes that the value of covariate is constant until the next situation. Okay, now let's go back to our last example. Uh, as a reminder, our data were collected from the patients with hip OA undergoing physical therapy, and the goal is uh, to reduce pain, keep pain, improve the quality of life, and potentially prevent surgical intervention. If PT doesn't help, and the patient and his physician make decision about total hip replacement, this patient will be sent to another PT clinic. The first visit will begin with uh, initial, Evaluation, the PT will ask um, the patient to gather more information about the history of the problem, for example, age at um, hip OA diagnosis, medical history, and the personal information such as gender, race. And uh, this information will be collected only once, so it will not change. So at each visit, the participants wait blood pressure, temperature uh, will be measured. And in addition, the patient report questionnaire is completed to calculate the WOMAC score. Total hip replacement uh, is um, not really collected as time-dependent variable, but we inherently know that the event hasn't happened because patients are coming to this therapy. If the patient had the surgery, the office manager um, we'll uh, have the date uh, of surgery from hospital and uh, failure time may or may not be observed. If we don't observe failure time, we have sensory time. 
which is the date of the last visit. So you can see that our first four poll questions had all PT sessions and um, it was beneficial. He did have a total hip replacement surgery. And second one, green, he had total hip replacement after uh, first follow up and um, he wasn't able to complete the surgery. But we know the exact date of his um, surgery. Okay, uh, let's continue with this example and separate these different types of covariates this way. Purple square boxes are demographic and clinical characteristics we measure or obtain during the first visit only. And at each visit, patient report questionnaire is completed and we can obtain WOMOC score. And here, WOMOC IT is a WOMOC score for patient number I at the time T. In addition, we have information about hip replacement surgery, both yes-no indicator and the time of surgery or exenting. So orange square boxes indicate the information that we obtain at each visit, including the first one. Okay, now let's have uh, the question for our longitudinal submodel. And uh, we adjusted this model for the baseline covariate years after diagnosis. This is important covariate in this analysis. And but the years is the question. And remember that beta zero and beta one are mean sample intercept and slope. And uh, each individual I trajectory is related to the sample trajectory to random approximates. Now let's have uh, a question for survival submodel. Here H0 T is baseline hazard. And we adjusted the model for gender race and years after the diagnosis. Uh, you can see that the baseline coverage can be shared between models. So we adjusted both Cox uh, PH and LMM for um, years after uh, hip OA diagnosis, but they both have to be the same. And here gamma gender, gamma race, and gamma years are regression coefficients for the corresponding baseline coverage. So now we're approaching the central part of joint model and I would like to introduce you a matrix, MIT. This is a new term and it is very important in joint modeling. What is actually MIT? This is true and unobserved value of WOMOC score at the time T. This is how this matrix called in joint model books and papers, the true and unobserved. And please keep this observation in mind. We will refer and go back to it. So remember that we also observe WOMOC IT at each visit. That's why WOMOC here is in orange square box. Square because we observe it and orange because we update this very time. Are they actually the same MIT and WOMOC IT? No, they not. And of course, they are related. They should be related. And uh, because WOMOC IT is a sum of MIT and uh, general error epsilon IT. In other words, that's what we observe, but without the error. We observe WOMOC only a specific time point and it can be measured with the errors and subject to daily weekly fluctuation. That's the beauty of the joint model. We send this true value to the survival submodel, not the observed WOMOC score. And another advantage, we have WOMOC observed only a specific time point only, but we can obtain the estimation of MIT at any time. So we do not observe MIT. That means that we have to estimate this. That's why we have including our longitudinal submodel. We need both fixed and random uh, effects betas and bs to estimate MIT. And coefficient betas and bs are not observed as well. Let's organize them this way and separate the fixed and random effects. 
Uh, we will move uh, from our illustrative example to the more general diagram and remove the formulas and uh, add some errors. So let's move all betas on the left. And now we will move all random effects Bs on the right. So now let's flip the fixed effects, then random effects. And now we have this in more general diagram. So now we know how to interpret all notations except alpha. What is actually alpha? This parameter captures the association between longitudinal trajectory and time to event. Alpha relates the event occurrence to the longitudinal process. Now we have more general picture and the whole idea behind joint model is to couple the survival model with the right uh, model for the repeated measurements of time dependent covariate. Square boxes represent the observed point, both baseline or time stable, covariates and time dependent original outcome. Ovals uh, represent unobserved terms, vectors of fixed and uh, random effects, B, beta and gamma. Here, the red dashed box indicates that the baseline covariates can be shared between two submodels. And this is the same diagram uh, represented with more general formulas for longitudinal and survival submodels. And you can see again that joint model consists of two submodels representing the changes of longitudinal and time data. And uh, a here, here is a, a baseline hazard. So this is another representation of joint model. Here the blue solid line in the top panel shows the survival function. The blue dashed line in the bottom panel corresponds to the approximation of longitudinal trajectory of biomarker in Cox model. A value of biomarker observed and recorded only a specific time will be remain the same until between two visits and will be associated with the risk of event until the next week. The solid red line represents the approximation of original trajectory in joint model. And now we introduce to you the joint model framework. Here the risk for an event at a particular time t depends on the true level of the longitudinal marker at the same time point. This model sometimes called standard or basic joint model. And now I will talk about the extension of standard joint model and will explain briefly how different extension of this joint model can help researchers in answering different research questions. So extensions of standard joint model, why do we need them? I will give you some examples. And um, the first one, when the risk at the age t depends on the level of biomarker of the age uh, t minus one here. So when it can be useful? Uh, imagine you have um, data from lung cancer patients and um, you have time to event outcome, time to death from lung cancer. And your time dependent covariate is a uh, the number of cigarettes the patient smoked every day. So you probably can run joint model with this time varying covariates and will observe very strange results. Uh, and uh, you will probably see that the number of cigarettes is uh, negatively associated with the risk of, of death. Why? Uh, the one explanation is uh, because patient that is very sick and at the end stage of disease, uh, he cannot smoke that much anymore. So, and uh, the better way is uh, to look for association that um, uh, how the number of cigarettes that this patient was smoking five years ago or one year ago was associated with the risk of death. Uh, another example is uh, when biomarker behaves differently for women and men or for participants taking or not taking some drugs. And uh, this is very common in um, 
um, clinical trials and um, also the risk can depend on the rate of change. So I will spend a few more minutes and explain how it works and uh, let's start with time-dependent slope uh, parameterization. So here is the same picture uh, but uh, you can see that we have uh, uh, two additional errors. Uh, this parameterization of joint model allows um, incorporating the rate of change into the model and here the survival process can depend on slope like it showed here, to capture the situation when two people have the same level of biomarker, uh, but the rate of change is different. For example, you have two participants, MH, base, gender, and they have both uh, BMI of 25, but one is losing the weight, but another one is gaining the weight. This extension is very useful in many situations in clinical practice when the doctor uh, look not at the level of different biomarkers but also on its dynamic. So the purpose of cumulative effect parameterization is uh, to include the entire history of longitudinal response into survival submodel. Look at this picture. Uh, it can be done with the integral of the longitudinal trajectory and here is uh, the example when this extension can be useful. Uh, imagine you have an exam research question. Can loss in body mass reverse the effect of long-term obesity? So you will use the whole history of this patient. You know, his uh, weight for many, many years. And now let's look at joint model uh, from a different perspective. Up to this moment, we were talking about appropriate modeling of time-dependent outcome while accounting for time-dependent coverage of interest. But we can also model the longitudinal trajectory in the framework of joint model. Uh, Carolina mentioned before that ignoring the mechanism of missingness can cause bias in estimates in uh, LMM. Here is an example. We have clinical trial with true groups, PT treatment, and waste control. The purple person from wait list group completed baseline and both follow ups visit. The green person from PT group was dropped before second follow up because he was not eligible. For example, because he had total hip replacement, total knee replacement surgery. His data from second follow up are missing. In the joint model framework, drop out time can be considered a survival outcome. And longitudinal submodel can be used to obtain valid inferences with the correction for this non-ignorable dropout. Okay, now we have uh, this table, summary table, and you can see that we have additional row for joint model. And all these models, uh, they are very useful in modeling and useful in answering your research question, but it's always um, needed to choose the right one. And so now we'll just finish up our presentation here today with an overview of statistical computing. Uh, so some software tools that you can use to try to incorporate some of these model uh, methods. Um, so are there are many available packages that you can find and you can use a lot of these a lot of these are very recent and they build on some of the older packages in tax there are a couple of macros as well that you can use instead of having an available mo module and uh, we also know that m plus has um, available applications for the model so there are there's a lot of emergence here on ways uh, on, on and packages here and uh, software that can incorporate on joint models. Uh, and so, just want to conclude today. We went over the overview of longitudinal data analysis with linear mix models and type of end data analysis with cost proportional hazards model. Again, very standard practices, very used a lot in the, the literature uh, and in research, very well so, but we. Hopefully, 
gave you a good introduction to the models. We talked about the differences between external and internal covariates and how that is something that might bring you to have to consider uh, something beyond the time dependent costs. Um, so some points why that might not be optimal, specifically when you have those internal covariates. Uh, and Lubov went over the framework of the joint model uh, with a kind of a work by through example when you're combining that longitudinal biomarker and time to event um, information. We want to acknowledge here acknowledgements. Thank you all for your attention today. And here are some very good references uh, for joint model, of course, uh, but even for time to event and uh, linear mixed model analysis.